today I will uh, introduce a number of packages to play with uh, GS data in R and uh, I will mostly focus on making maps. First of all, I'd like to introduce a couple of resources that I think are really useful. And again, um, the, the links are all on the slide so you can access that uh, anytime on our, uh, from our page. Uh, this is a great site for free GS data. Uh, there are a number of books that are open source online and really informative. Um, there's a tutorial, there's a, a great website, and then there's also a link to um, a page from CREN, so from the R uh, development uh, website, where you have a list of all of the packages that have to do with spatial data. So it's a very, very long list. Uh, but that can be a good reference. And then uh, there is also a mailing list, even though mailing lists these days are a little bit uh, out of fashion. So for today's webinar, we will use uh, data from some uh, Alaska and Western uh, US and Canada glaciers, uh, some time series of uh, a few glaciers of Glacier National Park and those who attended the first GIS in our webinar, we used those. And then we will also use data, uh, which is an estimate of the ice thickness of glacier. And for our base map, we will use Natural Earth, which is a public domain data set that can easily be accessed from within R thanks to R Natural Earth, which provides a number of functions and our natural earth data, which uh, contains the actual data. So first of all, um, of course, if you wanted to run this code uh, after, afterwards, you would have to load the packages in your R session. And these are the packages that we will be using today. So as uh, you can see, uh, there are lots of them. So SF is the key uh, package nowadays for vector data manipulation that stands for simple feature. And it's really a package that has worked hard at implementing uh, standard GS practices into R. TMAP is a wonderful map package. Then uh, there are a number of packages that are classic da data manipulation and have nothing to do with GS. The R Natural Earth, um, that's for the base map, we already talked about that. Map view allowed uh, to access tiled web map. Uh, grid uh, combines several plots together and we will use that to create an inset map. GGMap is a very, very powerful great package that allows to download base map data from uh, um, OpenStreetMap, uh, Google, uh, Stamen. But the problem is that uh, things changed recently and now Google requires registration. Uh, and so you have to create an account in the API and you even have to add your credit card number even if you only access free services. So GGMap um, has become less exciting because Google has made it much harder to download uh, the data now. Base Maps is a, a novel package that uh, allows to download Base Map without having to register, but it's harder to combine with SF objects. GGplot2 is a package most of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with. It's a classic floating package from the tidyverse, it can also be used to map GS data. So that would be an alternative to TMAP, um, even though today I will mostly use TMAP. And then finally, raster is a package that allows to play with raster in, uh, and like, instead of vector data. So raster data, that's, also, that's greedy data. That's a, a data that uh, is set on the grid. So, of course, before you can load any of these packages into a session, you have to have them installed on your machine. And so, just as a little refresher, in R, you install a package with install.packages. And um, all of the packages in the list 
uh, that I'm going to use today are on CRAN, so you can install them directly in this fashion, except for this fairly new base maps package. Um, this one isn't on CRAN yet, so you have to install it from GitHub. And to install packages from GitHub, you first need to install DevTools. DevTools is on CRAN, so you install it in the classic way. And then, uh, thanks to the install GitHub function of DevTools, you can install uh, a package directly from GitHub. So let's get started. And if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself, jump in uh, and interrupt if you wish, or uh, type in the chat and Alex and I will try to answer. So the, the first pass package is SF. And that's really a great package for spatial vector data manipulation. Um, you can use the function stread from SF to read in uh, data um, into R. And this is what we're doing uh, here with this Randolph Glacier inventory data. So first, you uh, this is the, the site. You can download the data as zip files. Then you can unzip the data. And um, you have classic shapefile data that you could use into uh, ArcGIS or QGIS. And stread allows you to read in those shapefiles into R. And that creates an SF object. So of course, uh, you have to make sure that the path is correct. So either you can use the uh, absolute path or if you're using the relative path, that's going to be relative to where R is running. And to see where R is running, you need to, to get your working directory with get WD. So as soon as you create those two SF objects by reading in the data, um, you get an output from R that tells you that uh, those are S3 shapefile. Uh, the first one for the Alaska data set has 27,108 uh, features and 22 fields. So that means that we have 22 uh, variables, 22 columns, and we have 27,000 and a bit um, actual uh, row. So those are the number of actual glaciers. The geometry type is a polygon. Uh, an interesting piece of information is the B, B box. We'll talk about it a fair bit. That's the bounding box. The bounding box are the coordinates of the rectangle that set the, the limit or the boundary of your SF object. And then you have the CRS. Uh, that's the coordinate reference system, because you know that, of course, uh, the Earth isn't flat. Uh, and so when we try to represent this three-dimensional space into a two-dimensional plane, uh, we have to project it somehow. And there are very many different projection, projection systems, and they all have advantages and disadvantages. And depending on what you want to show, the place of the world you're in, if you're near the pole, near the equator, etc. One or another might be more suitable. But um, whenever you combine multiple uh, spatial objects, you have to ensure that they use the same CRS. Because otherwise, uh, if they're projected f following different CRS, your um, you can't compare them, you can't uh, uh, combine them, you can't uh, do anything useful with them, really. And we have similar information for the Western and Canada uh, data set. So we have created those two SF objects, AK for the um, Randolph Glacier Inventory for Alaska, and I called WES for Western US and Canada. So let's have a look at the data. If I uh, simply run AK into R, 
R outputs all this information about AK. And right away, you can see that this very much looks like a data frame. Uh, a simple fixture object is in fact a data frame with the only particularity that the last column is a list. So it's a column, a list column, and that's the, the geometry uh, column. But, and you could actually get rid of that geometry column, and then you would be left with a classic data frame. So uh, here we, ha we have our 22 variables, our, our, um, our lines. And so each glacier has an RGI for Ranger Glacier Inventory ID. And uh, we'll, we'll use that at the end of the, the webinar. So just uh, remember this. And uh, you have some dates, uh, longitude, latitude, etc. And the actual geometry information is in this list column. Uh, this is where the coordinates are. If we look at the structure of our SF object, you can see that it's both class SF and data frame. And so you have uh, the uh, class of uh, each of the variables. So you have a number of characters, some numerics, some integer. And at the end, you can see that the uh, class of this geometry column, it's an SFC polygon. Uh, and this is a list which itself has a, uh, some numeric and character and etc. So this last column is much more complex, but otherwise it's a very familiar object. And this is great and makes it really convenient because it allows to do on an SF object all of the manipulations that you are super familiar with uh, in a classic data frame using dplyr and uh, the tidyverse package, for instance. So now let's let's map this data. And as I said, tmap is uh, one of the, the great mapping uh, package for GIS data. So again, I will emphasize this throughout the talk. Before you play with uh, multiple objects, you have to ensure that they have the same CRS. We, we created two SF objects, one for Alaska, one for um, Western US, and Canada, we'd like to map the glaciers of those two data set together. So we have to ensure that they have the same CRS. And STCRS is one of the function of SF, and it outputs the CRS of an SF object. And so yes, they are the same, so we're good to go. Now, of note, the bounding uh, box are different, and that makes sense because they're two different area in space. One is Alaska, the other one is uh, further south. So they, they don't match. They're, we are not putting two maps that overlap with each other. They are disjoint in space. And so we'll have to uh, be careful what B-box we use when we actually plot the data. To do that, we will create an union of the bounding boxes. And so this is a bit of tweaking, but it's actually fairly, fairly simple. The STB box allows to extract the um, B box information or the SF object. So we do it for our WES and our AK object. Then we pass those new objects into the ST as SFC function. And so this SFC that's the class of the list column where the geometric information uh, is stored at the end of the SF object. So we are transforming it as an SFC object. Once we have them as SFC object, we can play with them. And in this case, we can make uh, an, a union of them to combine them thanks to the ST union function. All those ST underscore, they're all functions from the SF package. And as you can notice, uh, they use the very uh, standard uh, way of naming functions that the tidyverse um, started. So they're very, very tidyverse friendly, basically. Then once you have 
run the union, you can pass that SFC object into STB box to create a new B box. So you can't create the union of bounding, bounding box right away. You have to convert them to SFC objects. Then you can create the union. And then you have to convert them back as bounding box. So it's a bit conv convoluted, but that's how it works. And so now we have a new bounding box for our big map that will have both Alaska and uh, the Western uh, North America, excluding Alaska. So we can actually plot using TMAP our, glacier, our, glacier, our glaciers of Western North America. The way TMAP works is extremely similar with um, ggplot2. It's the same grammar of graphic. So you have the plus sign to add a number of elements. The key element in the case of TMAP is the TM shape. That's what starts a new layer. And then you have all the characteristic characteristics of that layer. And then as you will see later, we can add additional layers onto that. And the order matters because the new layers, as with ggplot2, and as happens if you use a GUI GS, uh, such as ArcGS, the layers will be added on top of each other. But here we are plotting a single layer. So we have TM shape called only once. Uh, no, actually, sorry, sorry, sorry. We are plotting two layers because we haven't combined our two SF objects together. So my bad. We are plotting two layers. So we have TM shape twice. The first layer is with uh, uh, the Alaska data, but uh, we are seeding the bounding box in this first layer as the new bounding box that we created that has both bounding boxes. So that sets the bounding box for the whole map. And so we join the bounding box, but we haven't joined the, the, the data. So first layer, Alaska data with our joint pointing box. Then the following element is how we want to plot that layer. So you have a number of uh, TM uh, functions from TMAP. Uh, you have borders that will create the outline, fill that will create the, the content, polygons is both the borders and the outline, etc. Uh, I mean, both the borders and the, 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 the coloring uh, at once. So we want to see the borders and the coloring. Then we had a second layer for uh, the western part of North America. Here again, we add a TM polygons as the, the characteristic for that layer. And then TM layout is um, a way to add some general layout for your map. So this is where you can set the title, title position, title size, background color, margins. Uh, this is the width of the frame and the number of um, elements here is huge. It's very similar to ggplot2. It's very wordy, uh, but uh, allows lots of cost customization. And as with any function in R, if you want to see all of the uh, attributes that can be passed to the function, you can open the help file by typing question mark tm underscore layout. So we can add a compass, we can add some scale bar. And so we add all of these layers. And what we get um, is this. So we added a title, a compass, um, a scale bar. We have our bounding box, which is the union of the two initial bounding box. We have the Alaska data set. Uh, at the top and the uh, Western North America data set at the bottom, like uh, Western Canada and Western US uh, in the lower 48. So we have just uh, mapped 
all of the uh, ranger glacier inventory data for this part of the world. So this is great, but um, it's nicer to have a base map because here we have just the data. And because there's a lot of data, well, we can see, we can guess the shape of North America. But if um, it's not great, but it's not terrible not to have it here. But in many contexts, if you don't have a base map, you have some data elements uh, without context. So that's not great. So let's, let's add a base map. And there are many options for that. But one really simple option, if you want something fairly basic, is our natural Earth. So NE states is a function from our natural Earth that allows to get uh, states information. So I'm interested in Canada and the US because um, you can get a base map for uh, the entire Earth with this. You can create many type of objects. So here we want to create an SF object because we are playing with SF objects. But you could create SP objects or uh, other alternatives. SP used to be the popular package before SF uh, was launched. And then, uh, so I create this SF object, states all, that has all of the states and provinces of Canada and the US. But because the map is only for the western part of North America, I don't need all of the state and province. So let's uh, select only the ones that are relevant. So you can see that I am using from an SF object, states all is an SF object, the exact same syntax using the dplyr uh, pipe and a filter function that you would use uh, in a data frame or a table context. So this is really convenient. So I'm selecting relevant states and I create a new SF object that I call states. So as always, let's check that the CRS of our base map is the same as the CRS as uh, one of our maps, for instance, Alaska. It's the case here, so great. Now, note that the bounding boxes are different as well. And here, we will not do uh, the union of the bounding boxes because we don't care about the base map outside of the range of our own data. So here, instead of creating a map encompassing all of our base map and all of our data, we will only map our data. The rest of the base map, of course, is totally uh, uninteresting. So using Tmap as before, but we have more layers now. We have a first layer uh, with our new SF object states. As a bounding box, we are using the bounding box we created OK, yeah, so we will get to that. Uh, you, you haven't uh, missed it. Um, so far, all the um, uh, CRS have matched. But in a bit, we will cover an example where they don't. And so I will show you how you can reproject an SF object from one CRS to another. That's a, a very good question, of course. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover that. So. Notice that for the bounding box, I am using the bounding box that we created earlier with the union of uh, our two data sets. Here uh, in the TM polygons, which uh, remember is the characteristic of this first layer, I am adding some information. Um, I am setting the color and the width. Then I have the layer for Alaska. And here again, I am adding some, uh, some colors. I told you that TM polygons was a combination of TM borders and TM fill. So usually, you can use uh, TM polygons instead of having to break it down. But here, I need to break it down because 
I want to have a different color for the, the, the border and for the field. So that's why uh, I broke down TM polygons as TM borders and TM field. And I did the same for the uh, our West object. And then again, uh, some layouts, of course, you will have to tweak a number of things, update the title, etc. re uh, fidget a little bit to make sure things look good. And this is what we have now. So the reason I uh, changed the colors was to make the glaciers track out a little bit. And so I, uh, I broke things down to uh, try to like the, the defaults don't always look good. You have to fidget a little bit. But so now we have the same data. We, dis we are displaying the same data we displayed earlier, but we have a base map of uh, the relevant part of the world, which makes it a little bit nicer to see where we are. So that's a very first uh, simple uh, example. Now we will start using the second data set to get into uh, something a little bit more interesting. We will map based on an attribute variable. So an attribute variable that's going to be one of your column on your SF object. The Ranger Glacier Inventory only has uh, one excuse me, set of data per glacier. So it's nice to make a map, but that's all uh, it has. But um, for Glacier National Park, which is in Montana, the USGS has a little time series of 39 glaciers for the year 66, 98, 2005, and 2015. And so there will be different columns and different um, uh, spatial data for those different times and we will be able to map based on the year attribute variable which is more cool so first off uh, and i will go over this a little bit uh, fast because it's not uh, relevant to gis but those four data sets had some inconsistencies and in when you program it's never really great to copy past and to repeat code. You should always aim to vectorize things, uh, uh, use some functional programming approach or uh, create some loops or create some way to avoid unnecessary repetition. And so here, instead of uh, loading one data set, cleaning it, preparing it and doing this four times, what I'm doing instead is that I'm creating a function that will read the data with ST read, that will uh, fix the inconsistencies by uh, uh, somewhere in capital letters, I'm putting everything to uh, lowercase. Uh, I'm selecting only the variables that I'm interested in. Then I'm creating a vector with the uh, data set names using a little regular expression and using map map is a function in the per package so it has nothing to do with uh, GS mapping that's uh, uh, that it's a reference to the map function in C I am uh, using per to pass every element of deer so every data set so there are four here uh, into the function prep. So this is a, a functional programming approach. And that outputs a list. And we will combine our uh, for list with our bind. But before we combine the list, we want to ensure that the CRS are the same. And so um, the syntax here may look a little puzzling to you. It's because map outputs a list and within that list we have four uh, element each for one of the data set so uh, to access one data set uh, GNP stands for I uh, that's the name I gave uh, my object for a glacier national park so to access the first um, 
data set of GNP, so the, the first year, I have to index from the GNP list the first element and then the second element and etc. And so I'm comparing the uh, CRS, they're all the same, so I can now squish my list into a regular SF object. So we're out of the messy list business thanks to um, this call here. So now I have a GNP uh, SF object. Um, it has uh, one column for the year. So uh, the first uh, year of data is 1966, but then there are an additional three years. That's the glacier name, uh, the area, etc. And uh, as always, for all SF objects, we have the uh, uh, list column uh, of geometry at the end. You can look at the structure. It's very similar to the structure of previous SF objects. And you can see that uh, one of the variable is year, and um, it is uh, entered as a character. So it's, uh, but well, but maybe not uh, the decision uh, that would have been ideal. But it, it doesn't matter. And uh, yeah. So let's map GNP. We are mapping just GNP for now. So uh, using TMAP as always, TM shape. But then we will also uh, use TM polygons, so the borders and the field at the same time. But here, because we are interested in mapping uh, based on one variable, inside the TM polygons function, I will put year, which is the variable I'm interested in putting as a, a, a changing variable, and I will use a palette of blues. And then the rest uh, is, uh, you know, classic uh, setting a title, the margin, the compass, the scale bar, etc. And this is what we get. So these are all the glaciers, the 39 glaciers um, that are recorded in that data set. And we have the um, uh, years. But OK, this is not a very useful map. We can't see anything. We don't even know where we are in the world. Um, it's not great. Maybe we could put it as an inset map into our bigger map so that we can at least see which those glaciers are in the whole of um, Western North America. So in order to do that, because we will combine two uh, different C, um, uh, uh, SF objects, we have to ensure that the CRS are the same. And in this case, they aren't. So we will go over how to handle this case. Boo. So it's actually very simple. Um, we will transform the GNP um, uh, object. We could have chosen the other one. Which one you choose depends on uh, the CRS you want to have at the end, uh, depends on the final map. Um, that's a personal decision. There's no hard rule. It depends on the situation. In this case, uh, I decided to reproject GNP following the CRS of uh, Alaska, because remember that Wes has the same um, CRS and states also, like they're all the same. So the function, it's uh, another of the SF function, is called ST transform. And so I am transforming GNP uh, to match the CRS of Alaska, and I'm reassigning that to GNP. Super simple. And now they match. So how do we create an inset map? First, we want to create a little rectangle that we will put inside our main map to show where the inset is located. 
And to do that, we start with the bounding box of GNP, so our, uh, our little uh, Glacier National Park map, and we transform it as an SFC object. Uh, we saw this function already. That's a way to transform a bounding box as a full uh, column geometric object. And let's call it GNP zone. So now this is a full SF object. It only has the last column. It only has the geometry list column of the data frame. It doesn't have any other variable, but that's still an SF object. It's a simple SF object, but it's an SF object. So since it's an SF object, we can map it um, in the same fashion. So now we can add to our big North American map a layer with TM shape and this new object. And um, here, we don't want to have any feel. Uh, I mean, we could, I guess, uh, but uh, it's nicer, I think, not to fill it in and to just have the border. So I'm using TM borders and uh, I'm tweaking the width of the frame and the color. Okay, so then we need to create uh, a, a TMAP object for, oh, and by the way, um, yeah, no, that's fine. So we then need to create a TMAP object for our main map. So far, we have plotted maps, but we haven't created TMAP objects. So here, we run the same uh, type of code we're familiar with, but we assign it to an object, and this object will be a TMAP object. So we run some code that is very similar to the code we ran earlier when we plotted uh, AK and WES, and the base map. So we use states with the, the B box of the union, uh, the color tweaking, etc. We make sure the title is okay, etc. etc. But instead of plotting it, we assign it to a TMAP object called main map. Then we have to create a TMAP object for the inset map. So this is fairly similar to the uh, Glacier National Park plot that we made earlier, except that uh, we don't need a title for the inset map because uh, the inset map is just an inset. So you don't want to have a, two titles in the plot, right? And you also don't need two compass in the plot or two, uh, etc. So you have to tweak it a little bit, but um, that's the same um, type of code we saw when we. Uh, created that last map. But uh, instead of plotting it to the output, we assign it to an inset map, uh, tmap object. And then as a final step, we need to combine our two tmap objects. And we will do that with the viewport function from the grid package. And um, the ratios here are a bit challenging to set. There's a bit of trial and error to, to do to get this to work. It's not super well documented, but um, this is what you can get. So, so let's go over all the layers. We have one layer that's our Alaska data, one layer that's our West data, we have the layer of our base map. Um, we have the layer, like our very simple SF object that we created just from the bounding box of the Glacier National Park map. Uh, and we changed the color to match the frame of the inset map. Uh, so the inset map is not a layer, in fact, it's just been added on top of the other map with grid. So we have a number of layers on that map, but this is kind of like a different map that was added onto it with grid. But uh, it's not exactly useful to have this legend because we can't really see things at that scale. And so maybe we should have the colors here match the colors of the glacier in the main map. So uh, 
we could tweak things a little bit, change some colors. So break down TM polygons into TM borders and TM fill, assign some uh, blue colors that match those of the main map and uh, get rid of the legend with something like uh, legend show equals false. And uh, we get something like that. So uh, of course it takes time and I'm not a GIS expert, so this is not uh, very fancy, but you can see that within R, you can get some pretty neat results. You don't need um, uh, necessarily a GUI to create uh, a map. Is everybody doing okay so far? Well, I don't hear anything, so I'm taking that as a yes. So in this Glacier National Park data, we have four years of data sets, but we can't really see the retreat of glaciers because the, the scale is so small, like we're, we're zoomed out too much. So let's pick one glacier. So let's subset that GNP data so that we can see what's going on at the level, at the scale of one glacier. So for instance, let's uh, look at the Agassi Glacier, which is one of the Glacier National Park Glacier. We simply use filter, like we, we uh, used that already uh, for the base map layer before. So classic uh, data frame uh, deep layer type syntax. And um, I'm creating a new SF object that I'm calling AG for Agassi that uh, only has, oh, and actually, sorry, I made a typo. Uh, here it should read GNP. If you're wondering what this G is, that's a mistake. I'll fix it after the talk. So I start with the GNP SF object, and from it, I filter all the data for which the GLAC name, so the, the glacier name, is equal to Agassi Glacier. And I create a new SF object. And so because there is only one Agassi Glacier, but because we have four years of data, that will actually select four rows. And then I can map this new um, uh, SF object, uh, still uh, with Tmap. And this is what I get. And so now I can see a little bit more the retreat of glacier. So that's a scale that allows to see this uh, changing variable. And so you can see that over time. So uh, this was the the area in 1966, uh, and, and by 2015, all the, the southern part had totally melted, we're down to here, and by now it's probably much smaller uh, still. So as a side note, you can use ggplot2 instead of tmap, and this is the syntax that you would be using. Uh, so classic ggplot syntax, first having your, uh, your, your data, and then the geom that you'd be using is called geom sf. In this case here, um, we're interested in the fill per year, and uh, we can use scale fill drawer if we want to uh, use the blue palette. So uh, you'd have to play a little bit with it to, to set the, um, the scale and the compass and etc. Uh, but you can get a very similar result, except that by default, ggplot has a lot of gray background. So um, you have to, uh, to get rid of the, the, the default ggplot format is not great, but if you get rid of that gray background, you can get uh, some excellent results with ggplot as well. Oop, what's going on? Okay, so um, what if we wanted to, add a base map onto our GNP area. I showed you our natural earth, but that's great if you want limited uh, information such as provinces, countries, cities. But if you want uh, a, a Google map, uh, Google earth type of information, that's a little too limited. So. As I mentioned, ggmap is really great because it allows to download uh, from uh, OpenStreetMap or uh, 
a Google map or a, a Strayman, Strayman, some like a base map layer that you can then uh, add to your map. And get map is the main function of the ggmap package. And uh, all you need to give to this function are the limits of the bounding box you're interested in. You have to mention left, bottom, right, top, uh, and then where you want that data from. So for instance, uh, OSM for OpenStreetMap, or you could put Google or Stamen. And so here, the bounding box that I'm interested in uh, are the uh, the like a, the bounding box of an SF object is a list uh, or vector, in fact, of four values. So uh, I'm interested in the as a as the left boundary of the first value because it's actually the the first value of the uh, bounding box vector is the um, x min, and then we have y min, uh, uh, x max, and y max. So I'm using the bounding box of a g, and with this, uh, I could get a very beautiful uh, base map of uh, OpenStreetMap or Google or etc. as a layer that I can then use as one of my layers in Tmap. And that used to work beautifully out of the box, but now Google requires a uh, uh, registration and you need to put your visa card and, and etc. And um, so th there's still lots of uh, free data. You don't have to, you can get a fair bit of data for free, uh, but it's not all free and uh, this is uh, very tedious and complicated things. So, uh, but uh, it's still good to know that ggmap allows you to do that. But I did not download the data because I did not register and so I can't show you the result. Um, base maps allows you to get a bit of information from very many different places as well. Uh, but the downside is that unlike ggmap, which uh, returns an SF object that can be created uh, combined with other layers within Tmap. Base maps, uh, at least I was not able to combine the output of uh, base map uh, functions with an SF object. Uh, it's a fairly small niche package, not very developed, and I couldn't get much out of it. So I could use it. Um, and I chose the S3 world imagery, but there are very many options of the type of map that you uh, want to, to use. And AG, like that's my IKC uh, map. I could get a nice satellite image of the Agassi glacier. And so you can recognize the shape of uh, Agassi. But what would be very nice, of course, would be to have our vector layers on top of this image and uh, ggmap would allow that but base maps at least at this point doesn't uh, maybe it will uh, get better but at this point i couldn't make much use of it so, so it's a nice image but uh, it's not very useful to create a map now let's have a quick look at faceted maps because we have four layers of data for the year for i guess a glacier we can, when we run uh, the, the tip map code, at the end, add a TM facets uh, function by year. And the rest is fairly similar to uh, the previous Agassi Glacier uh, code. What we get now is that instead of having all the layers on top of each other, we have them um, as, as uh, a faceted map. And we can even, from our faceted map, create an animation. So for that, first we have to create uh, an animation object, so an SF object 
um, that has facets. So we have a TM facets element. And then we pass this SF object into the TMAP animation. And now we have, um, and of course you can tweak the speed and uh, all sorts of things. Now we have, um, we see the layer one after the other. So you can get nice base maps onto your machine, but an alternative approach is to also use a web widget to interactively open a map in your browser thanks to Leaflet. So Leaflet is a, is a JavaScript um, library, but there are multiple packages in R that allow to access Leaflet. The simplest option is to use the function mapview from the package mapview. And for instance, with our uh, GNP, so the Glacier National Park SF object, you just run mapview GNP and it will open in your browser um, interactive maps. Then you can scroll, zoom in, zoom out, and you can select a number of views. So you have open topo map, uh, S3 world imagery. This is the same um, data that I used with base maps. And so those little blue dots, excuse me, those are the glaciers of Glacier National Park. So um, you can then zoom into your map and look at things. Uh, Tmap allows to do that as well. We've used Tmap in the uh, plot mode until now, but you can switch to a different mode that's called the view mode with Tmap mode view or simply by running TTM, TTM toggles. And then you can replot uh, the last map that you plotted. And instead of opening a map uh, in R, it will uh, open an interactive map in your browser where same thing, you can zoom in, zoom out, and, uh, and etc. But there is also an R package leaflet that allows to use uh, most or maybe even all of the functionality of the initial leaflet JavaScript. So while uh, Tmap and um, MapView are just super straightforward, super simple, but limited, this is uh, much more fancy. And so first you run the leaf leaflet function and that creates a map, uh, a map widget that's empty, and then you add layers onto it. So if you add tiles, uh, you, have, uh, you, you, you can start being able to zoom in and out, and then you can add polygons and, and you add a number of layers. So this is much more fancy, uh, much more complex. Uh, if you just want to have a quick look at your data, that's not what you want, would want to do. But if you want to create a shiny app, for instance, uh, that's something that's worth exploring. Leaflet combined with shiny. And now we're almost at the end of the hour. Let's talk a little bit about the raster data. Because so far, all the data that we have looked at uh, was vector data, was the, the borders of our glaciers. But uh, some data is in a gridded form for instance, uh, images, and um, SF doesn't deal with that. So th there are two packages for uh, raster data. There's stars, which is uh, fancy and very specific. The all-purpose raster package is simply called raster. And for this, we'll use the, the last data set, which is um, based on five different models, an estimation of the ice thickness of all the glaciers of the world. And what is, is really convenient is that that data set follows the Randolph Glacier Inventory version six, which we've been using so far. So it has the exact same nomenclature. Uh, that's, uh, uh, those two projects are well integrated. So that, that's really cool. So let's look at the Agassiz Glacier, since we're familiar with it now. First, let's extract the RGI ID. Remember that we had our WES object. Um, that was our SF object um, 
uh, for uh, Western uh, US and Canada. If we filter the name Agassiz Glacier NT, that's the name is one of the variable of the uh, Randolph um, data sets. We are going to filter just the line corresponding to Agassiz Glacier, and then we select the variable for the RGI idea. And we get this value here. So RGI 60, blah, 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 etc. dot tiff is the raster file <clears throat> from the, the i thickness data set that corresponds to Agassi. That data set doesn't have the name Agassi in it, but because it follows the same um, uh, um, um, naming uh, system, that's, uh, you can find it that way. So raster data can have multiple bands. For instance, if you have um, pictures, unless they're black and white pictures, but if you have color pictures, you will have three bands for the R, G, and B uh, layers. And so it's always nice when you deal with raster data to check how many bands you have. And the way to do that is to use stack, which is one of the raster functions. And stack allows to uh, get all of the bands of one object. So I'm passing my uh, TIFF uh, file to stack. And then I'm passing that to another raster function that is called n layers that outputs the number of layers in the stack. And here you can see there's only one. So there's only one layer, so one band, so we don't have to worry about which band to extract and etc. So in that case, we just run the file through the raster function from the raster package, and that creates a raster object. Uh, I called it AG RAS for Agassi raster. And this is what you get when you run the previous code. So the class, it's a raster layer, um, the CRS, um, with interesting, the unit is in meter. That's the, so that means that the thickness of ice is in meter. The units is something to pay attention to. The extent, so that's the, the equivalent of the bounding box in the, for the uh, uh, um, vector uh, objects we've looked at before. And if we look at the structure of that raster, raster object, uh, so yeah, you can see it's a, the class is raster layer from the raster package and uh, it has number of slots and um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, it's an S4 object. It's a bit of a complex object structure. Um, so we can use Tmap also with raster data, except that this time, instead of TM borders, TM fill, or TM polygons, we use TM raster. So I'm using um, TM shape to add the layer with AGRAS, similar to what we've seen before, but this time I use TM raster and then the classic uh, compass and scale and et cetera that we've seen plenty of times. And this is the map that I get. So this is the estimated ice thickness of the Agassiz glacier in meters. And I can combine that, and we're done after this last map, I can combine that with the um, Agassiz map that uh, I plotted earlier. So as always, ensure that the CRS are the same, they're not. So we could reproject one or the other, but reprojecting a raster object uh, is complicated. It can also be uh, very slow because raster uh, files are very, uh, can be very, very large. So in this situation, you're much better off uh, to reproject 
the non-raster object if you can. So I am not touching uh, AG RAS this time. I am reprojecting AG to match the uh, CRS of um, AG RAS. And this is the exact same code that we saw earlier, but I changed the um, syntax just for fun. Uh, I'm using this funky pipe, which is an assignment pipe from the Magrit R package. This means that I am transforming AG uh, based on AGRS and reassigning it to itself. It's a double-sided pipe. Uh, it passes the object from left to right and reassigned to the left. But uh, you could use the syntax we saw earlier. It's they're absolutely equivalent. So now we have matching CRS, so we can combine the plots. So we just have an additional layer. So uh, the layer of AG raster with TM raster, uh, because that's the, the only um, type of um, uh, char characteristics that you could, uh, like, uh, it's not the right word, but the, the only, uh, well, that's what you need to use for a, a raster layer. And then we have our AG layer uh, and uh, all the things we had in our previous map. And this is what we have. Oh, yeah, and, and of course, um, if you just put the maps on top of each other, the uh, blue feeling of the uh, various years are going to cover the depth of the glacier, or all the other way around, depending on, on the order in which you add your layers, because remember that the order matters. So. That wouldn't be very useful. So the ways to go around that is that instead of using polygons, you could use borders to only have the outline of the, the glacier. That would totally work. But you can also use transparency, which is the uh, alpha value. And this is why for TM polygons, I have uh, an alpha value here that I didn't have earlier. And that's what makes, I mean, it's not a very beautiful map, but it just shows you the kind of things that can be done. Um, at the bottom, I have the depth of ice, and at the top, uh, with some transparency, I have the retreat of the glacier. And remember that the ice thickness is not actual data, it's based on some modeling, so um, that might explain why, and also, it uh, I don't know when uh, the pictures it was it was made from might have been a bit old because it shows a fair bit of depth here even though we know that now there's no more ice anymore but but anyway that's uh, that's beside the point so we're a little bit over time i apologize for that i never seem to be able to finish on time ever uh, but i am happy to stick for as long as needed to answer questions you might have so please go ahead